the land was something that was given to the Indians by Monita, the great spirit. And it belonged to all equally, to be used by all equally and well, and to be respected and treasured and revered. And the whites didn't do this. And sometimes I go, just go out in the woods and stuff and I imagine these people. And I can sometimes picture him maybe. He was a very, you know, dignified man and uh, very strong and uh, very spiritual. He knew what he wanted to accomplish and he knew how to do it. He had a dream, he had a mission. And he was powerful enough to, to nearly pull it off. The Indians hated the whites coming in because the whites destroyed so much. They cut down the forests, they burned the prairies, they polluted the rivers. Uh, they just destroyed everything, and usually using only a very little of what they took. Tecumseh was a hero. Tecumseh was a real hero. He wasn't a hero that's been, you know, that's drawn on, on, on a piece of paper, and he's not a cartoon character. This, this man lived, he breathed. Uh, I'm sure he had his good points, I'm sure he had his bad points. But he's a real hero. Silent Society and Tecumseh, or what we know as Tecumseh today, was a dream that uh, an individual had, Rusty Mundell. And in 1970, uh, he brought uh, three other fellows and I together in the formation of a company. We became the founders of the Silent Society Incorporated. Rusty had read The Frontiersman, which was Alan's first book in the Winning of America series. And we read it and thought, you know, here's a man who knows Tecumseh, knows the story of the Shawnee Indian. Sure, I was hired to write a script, which was fine, and I, I was glad to, to have the job of doing it. But it was more than that. I had formed sort of a love affair of my own with Tecumseh because this was one of the most outstanding characters in human history that has ever lived. And to me, the the greatest man of his time, and probably of almost any time. Here was a man that, that embodied so much that is admirable. Mm -hmm. uh, he never went to school. Uh, he did learn to read and write uh, English and French and uh, a number of Indian dialects. Uh, he read a great deal, and uh, he listened to people very well and picked up a great deal. So he was self-educated in that respect. He had no formal education, as none of the Indians did, really. One of the most outstanding things about his character was the fact that, that he was a man with a great deal of humanity in him, even though it was his business as a war chief and as a, a warrior to, to fight and destroy uh, whites in battle. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. We really had no idea what we were trying to accomplish. We knew we wanted to produce an outdoor drama, and we were going to build this fancy amphitheater out on Sugarloaf Mountain. But we never had done this. We're not theater people, we're business people. And we just attacked it. Rusty went to Shawnee, Oklahoma, and met with Arthur Roulette, who was at that time the tribal chief of the Shawnee Indian Nation. We did not want to do this drama about the Shawnee Indians without their, their endorsement. We originally thought we were going to be able to develop and produce Tecumseh for $250,000. But when we premiered the drama in June of 1973, we had raised and spent $1,400,000. Uh, and it came from all kinds of sources, the federal government, the state government, and most importantly, the citizens and the people in this community. The evening of the premiere performance, we had been out there for days working. Most of us didn't work in our businesses at all those last couple of weeks. I can remember specifically driving back out to the amphitheater, knowing that at the point at that time I was president of the Silent Society, and uh, I'm going to have to say something that night. Not really sure about what it's going to be, and I'm not sure at all I know now what I said, but I was I was petrified uh, that here we are, we've come this far, and we're going to kick this thing off tonight but none of us really understood what we had done because we were so we were too close to it. Uh, it was an exciting evening. Uh, 
The show came off with, without a hitch. The amphitheater, of course, was packed. I, I think I felt at the time that we all, and, and I mean hundreds and hundreds of people, had really done something special for this community. The next day, we came down off the cloud and uh, realized now we got to run a business. You got to have a sense of bottom line. You got to have a sense of bottom line in terms of, of, of fiscal management, responsibility. And by the same token, you've got to consider the artistic side of this thing. You know, you can't have one without the other. In, in this particular drama, if the audience doesn't believe the reality of the moment and the situation, then you haven't done your job. So I have included a lot of elements of the ancient Greek drama into my particular approach. I wanted to have spectacle. I wanted to make use of cost great costuming and the horses on stage. I also wanted to really tell the story of a tragic hero. And Tecumseh certainly is a tragic hero. By tragic hero, we mean that man who sets the standards for his society. He's a very charismatic character. He had, he had prescience, for one thing. He was able to, to predict future events with a great deal of accuracy. He was a fantastic leader of men, even though he was never a chief in his own right. He was barred by tribal traditions to become a chief. And so he became a warrior leader and broke away from his own tribe because of part of this taboo and set up his own uh, group of, of Indians that were not tribal at all, that divorced themselves from tribal affiliations and became simply Indians in an effort to form a coalition, an amalgamation of Indians that would be able to ward off the whites and drive them back and retake their land. You know, it's difficult. Uh, and you don't really think about it until you're in the process is you're going to walk out one day and go, I need a first-rate pyrotechnician who can also act. They don't grow them, you know? They don't, they don't, grow, they don't grow in trees. And uh, equestrians who are apt at working with people and with horses, uh, getting the two of them together, uh, having an actor come in and having someone uh, have the ability to teach them how to load and fire a primitive weapon. I mean, it's a real weapon. You need people who are specialists in, in, in things like stunt work stage combat. You just don't throw 64 people up on a set who don't know how to, to do stage combat. Uh, the results would be obvious. So when we're doing these rehearsals from, from 9 o'clock in the morning until 10.30 at night and coordinating the horses coming down the ramps and the cannons going off on the top of the hill and the explosions in the pond so that everything works very much um, in sequence yet looks like it isn't planned. It has to have that air of spontaneity. It has to have that air of majesty. I always look forward to, you know, doing a cover every year, and it's always challenging, especially being Native American. You know, I can really bring out myself. I like, um, I have a, my own particular style I use, and um, it's very, uh, I'd probably say, very moving. And um, I like a lot of you know, motion and you know, bright colors and kind of a mystical feel to it too in my own works so I can carry that on to, you know, the cover. You know, when you get near an opening, and Tecumseh is no exception in, in theater, uh, within a week of opening, it's, you have this feeling, is, is this going to happen? Or, or how can it happen? Uh, it does. But it's, it's frenzy, it's hectic, it's, 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 but it's a controlled chaos. Um, you, have, uh, you have a dozen technical personnel working in different areas simultaneously integrating, in, integrating things into the show in, in preparation. You have rehearsals going on stage, and you have people in front of house getting ready uh, as well. I mean, we have other elements besides what happens on that set. There's a box office to do. Uh, and put together and get operating, um, you know, the, the, the entire ushering program, which is a monumental effort. The people who are involved in Tecumseh, the volunteers, the paid staff, everybody involved in this process has a sense of that, that it's important. What's happening here is important. Yes, it's theater. 
Yes, it's, it's fun. It's important. Why do these kids come out here and work for a salary that is very difficult to even get them through the week to live on? Why do they do that? You know, okay, they're actors, they're committed. Well, sure they are. But why do they come back and do Tecumseh for three, four, five years in a row, some of them 14? It's a show that we do enjoy, and it's part of our lives up here. This role, to come a piece, is one that I've really wanted to do for about seven or eight years now since I first worked here in 82. And it's, it's like a dream come true for me, one of my dreams come true. It's probably one of the best written female roles in outdoor drama, and it certainly is one of the strongest. So I'm very honored to be doing it this year. You know, the, the, the thing that makes outdoor drama so wonderful is that you sit out, uh, you sit out under a canopy of stars, uh, you, you hear sounds of nature, they're real, they're not on tape. Uh, you, you smell the fragrance of flowers blooming and trees and, and the new earth and spring and summer, and it also rains outside, you see. But weather is one of those adversities that is a part of the fabric of outdoor drama. The audiences understand, they know that if, if they come to see the show, there's a chance that it might rain. Uh, there's a chance it may not. And now, Tecumseh. Cue one a go. speak and the, the words would roll out of him and just mesmerize his audiences and they had never heard anyone speak the way he spoke. If it had not been for the prophet Tengswatawa uh, undermining his, his influence, he would probably have raised somewhere around 20 or 30,000 warriors to come against the whites. Well, the entire white army at that time was about 12,000 men. So the Americans would not have been able to stand up against that. greatest tributes I ever had was when I met Arthur Roulette for the first time. He was the, the, the um, chairman of the Shawnee tribe at that time, the principal chief of the Shawnee tribe. And we had corresponded, but we had never met in person. And I came to the drama, and uh, there were a group of people standing together. And uh, he was one of that group. He was a little rotund man, almost as wide as he was high. And uh, someone in that group pointed out that I was approaching, and he broke away from the group and he ran toward me, and it was almost like a ball rolling toward me. He was so heavy set. And he ran toward me and he threw his arms around me, and he buried his head against my chest and he started crying. And I stood there, I didn't know what to do. I mean, this was, and he finally looked back at me, and the tears were just pouring out of his eyes, and he said, you have brought Tecumseh to life again. Chief Seattle once said this, when the last red man shall have perished and the memory of my tribe shall have become a myth among the white men, these shores will swarm with the invisible dead of my tribe. At night, when the streets of your cities and villages are silent, and you think them deserted, they will throng with the returning hosts that once filled and still love this beautiful land. 
the white man will never be alone.